Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this seminar, but uh, I must say that they took quite a risk because I don't uh, consider myself really an expert on this topic, but, but uh, I must say I have learned quite a lot uh, while preparing this uh, presentation. So, here are my affiliations so during the past two years. I have also uh, worked together with uh, Duodecim and Raja Sipila in uh, one uh, project which I will uh, uh, have a talk after the coffee break. So, uh, Gerald Stuckey and, and co-workers emphasized recently in their article in, uh, published in the Journal of Rehabilitation Medicine that the meaning of rehabilitation will further increase. Population aging and chronic diseases in, uh, have impact uh, societies worldwide, as well as here in Finland. They wrote that rehabilitation aims to optimize people's functioning associated with diseases, injuries, and other health uh, conditions in the context of an individual's position in life and resources, and in interaction with the physical, human-built, attitudinal, and social environment. How about in Finland? Do the national current care guidelines include recommendations for rehabilitation? From 2012 uh, to 2014, about half of the published guidelines included rehabilitation recommendations. So there is material what to implement into practice, although in many guidelines there is still need to increase the role of rehabilitation. Is there any special characteristics of implementation in rehabilitation context? With this mess of a big picture, I, I try to show a process of an individual who has a health problem or who has many health problems. She or he seeks help, gets examinations, diagnosis, treatment plan, treatment and evaluation whether the problem is solved or not. Rehabilitation in general will start if the function is not achieved by the treatment or sometimes it's good to start with the treatment. So to combine these treatment and rehabilitation goals. However, people with many diseases and then um, another team uh, many diseases um, uh, may have several groups who take care of the different diseases. So there are many specialists around this person. And many teams take care of the re rehabilitation and, uh, and the disease. Um, the rehabilitation team is the one who is thinking about functioning, and the other teams are mainly um, thinking more about the disease or diseases. It would be ideal that these teams know what the others have planned together with the patient. Sometimes changing the treatment plan impacts rehabilitation and vice versa. So implementation of rehabilitation means that also those who don't belong to the rehabilitation team should also know the main ideas and goals and possibilities of rehabilitation. So we try to give patient-centered care and rehabilitation. What does this mean? Quite often, many different specialists participate in patient-centered care and rehabilitation. This picture could be an example of a patient with spinal cord injury or some neurological disease, for example. In addition to the challenge that implementation of a rehab 
rehabilitation process concerns many specialists, this process may happen in many places in different organizations. So the implementation has to take place in all these organizations and, and levels. Of course, part of the process may happen only at one level. However, rehabilitation is often a long process among interdisciplinary team, and it's dependent on right timing, good collaboration, continuous assessment and evaluation, and clear goal, goals. It's easy to understand that implementation of rehabilitation is important, but not very easy, and it needs enough time. When implement, uh, implementing a rehabilitation, it's also important to have a common framework. Uh, international classification of function is a good common uh, framework to everybody who is involved in a rehabilitation. The aim of rehabilitation process should be to improve uh, or maintain a person's activity and participation. And this framework is also good when we, we uh, study outcomes. So what do we know about the best ways to implement rehabilitation? One important phase is uh, um, knowledge translation and uh, there is uh, one systematic review, for example, by Scott and co-workers who found that we still have very limited information which knowledge translation strategy uh, would be the best across allied health professions. So we all know that there are many uh, professionals in a rehabilitation team, but, but how to uh, transfer knowledge in the best way, we don't know it yet. I found one article uh, by Sarkis and co-workers in their systematic re review, and uh, they studied the effectiveness of research implementation strategies for promoting evidence-informed policy and management decisions in healthcare. But I think this um, uh, model um, gives a good basic model and understanding also what should be taken into account when implementing uh, rehabilitation guidelines or processes. So the, uh, to establish imperative, build trust, people, uh, processes, outcome, develop shared vision, and then action change the mechanism. And we also have to provide resources to support change and employ effective communication strategies. An example of complexity of implementation uh, rehabilitation is here. So I divided the stroke rehabilitation uh, guideline into pieces. A current care guideline include recommendation for different phases of rehabilitation. There are recommendations for therapies which may be new for somebody, uh, uh, for some therapist. And, and the level of knowledge may differ a lot depending on the place or the level of the organization. So good planning and management of the implementation process is extremely important and may also need financial support and long-term goals as we uh, heard uh, just before. So for example, in our hospital, I, I've noticed that um, uh, the first phase of stroke re rehabilitation, um, they, um, what they do there, that uh, information didn't go to the next place. So, for example, to the, the inpatient rehabilitation. Uh, it's dependent on, uh, on people, uh, professionals, of course, but it was also dependent on their ICT systems. So uh, there are many places that we can um, um, get, uh, find barriers uh, in this process. 
we think that everybody knows what we do, but actually that's not, that's not true. And when we try to uh, build some new, so we have to go very uh, uh, careful every small things so that the, the process will go on. And it's even, even more um, uh, uh, difficult if we think that we should uh, implement uh, the rehabilitation system, uh, for example, at home, what, the, what people should do at home. Beckering and co-workers described it already about 15 years ago, uh, how to implement physiotherapy guidelines on low back pain. Their active strategy aimed to reduce barriers related to the guideline of the target group, social context, and organizational context. They wanted to build a model for improving professionals' knowledge and influencing the management of primary care clinicians. They divided the process into four steps, and for each step, uh, uh, different interventions for implementation could be chosen. Essential for effectiveness are information transfer, multiple interventions, reminders, multifaceted interventions, interactive educational meetings and strategies closely linked to the level of decision-making process. They used a questionnaire to the physiotherapist to evaluate the discrepancies and barriers between recommendations and the current management. They categorized the results into five groups. So knowledge and skills, attitude, features of the social context, organizational context, and other. And what they found, the most important discrepancy was the knowledge or skills of the physiotherapist and problems in cooperation with referring physician. So not so uncommon situation also nowadays in Finland, or at least in, in, in the region where I, I work. And they also um, uh, did the following. So for each discrepancy, a plan how to address this problem was planned and addressed in training with education, discussion, role play, feedback, or with reminders. So that was quite a kind of example. Then we know that there are multiple guidelines, for example, stroke guidelines, um, how to do synthesis for further purposes. The synthesis of practice guidelines for specific clinical applications is rather uncommon. Issues such as the clinical setting, who provides the interventions, and what level of expertise is required is often lacking. Paul Tavsky and co-workers point out that in rehabilitation, these and other contextual factors such as personal beliefs, differences in goals and power relationship between therapists and patients can influence outcomes. Paul Tavsky and co-workers aim to develop a synthesis that places recommendations in conceptually coherent structure that can inform program development. First, they define the health question, then search for guidelines defining the eligibility criteria. Intervention mapping use, uses the following concepts. Target outcomes, which are the long-term benefits that the intervention is de designed to achieve for its participants. Proximal objectives are the changes in that participant and her environment that are necessary for the outcomes. Pra practical strategies are the means or delivery modes that may be served these objectives. Because the focus was exercise programs that can be delivered in community settings, they did not 
uh, extract recommendations relating the use of robots or partial body weight support therapy or things like that. The identified eight target outcomes of exercise-based interventions, uh, three related the body structure and function, five to activities and participations in life roles. So they used the ICF framework. They also found seven proximal objectives focusing on the participant along with 38 associated strategies. In addition, eight proximal objectives concerned with program delivery and 57 associated strategies. So here are the, uh, the example of their uh, um, uh, intervention mapping. So this is uh, for the program content. So the numbers are uh, the number of the, the studies and uh, here is the pro proximal objective like increase muscle strength and then recommended strategies and then they they uh, check out uh, what how they were um, in these studies and and the next um, example is is about the program delivery uh, delivery strategies for example ensure dosage is sufficient to establish and maintain benefits and um, uh, recommended strategies is at least three days per week physical exercise and then they uh, found out how many how many uh, uh, count of uh, studies and uh, uh, what kind of level of evidence they found so they they try to com combine this information this kind of synthesis can be used to help to plan an effective intervention by providing best evidence suggestions addressing content delivery issues and other contextual factors by applying it in the development of an interventional manual for a clinical trial can inform organizational planning practitioner training and personalization of the intervention the essential components of this kind of synthesis could be applied in the planning of other rehabilitation programs. However, its feasibility and effectiveness for the purpose requires further evaluation. It can provide a checklist. Paul Tavsky and co-workers used uh, this, for example, to analyze the content of a stroke exercise-based program manual. The synthesis enables identification of limitations in guidelines that may affect implementation. It could be reasonable to do the synthesis in ICF framework. So this example showed that implementation of practice guidelines may be enhanced by generating accounts that are specific to a particular application which address the way they should be delivered along with other contextual factors. So, for the knowledge translation, there are passive or active methods, single or multi-component interventions. Other single knowledge translation interventions than education should be investigated. Active strategies are more expensive and we need more economic evaluations of these interventions. Are there patient groups who especially need implementation of rehabilitation? I would say that yes, there are. Estimates of the average cost of stroke in the USA varied a lot, but the average cost of hospitalization was about $20,000. The most efficient stroke service experiment was most successful in coordinating patient flow from hospital to home or nursing home. The worldwide cost of uh, dementia were estimated uh, 818 billion dollars in the USA in 2015 and had increased about 35 percent since 2010. Medical costs however are lower than costs of social care. 
In UK, hospital costs of hip fracture patients was estimated to be 14,000 pounds. And uh, in, the, uh, in the first and second year after the fracture, it was about 2,000 2, pounds. In low back pain, indirect cost resulting from lost work productivity represents a majority of costs. Largest proportion uh, of a, a medical cost was spent on physical therapy, about 17%, and inpatient services. For the pharmacy, about 13%, and for primary care, about 13%. The American Heart Association claims that cardiovascular disease costs will exceed $1 trillion by 2035, are the most costly and prevalent killer if left unchecked. And chronic obstructive pulmonary disease costs $50 billion, of which $30 billion are direct medical costs. There is evidence that the rehabilitation of patients with these diseases is effective. And implementation of rehabilitation could improve outcomes, decrease costs, and diminish burden and suffering of patients. I have some examples of, of some of these uh, disease groups. So, um, among uh, stroke patients, here are some barriers and enablers to uh, evidence-based practice for acute stroke. So poor organizational or institutional level support, health professionals limited skills to use particular therapy, low level of awareness, confidence in the effectiveness of a particular evidence-based therapy, limited medical facilities to support evidence uptake, and inadequate peer support among health professionals. But we should also uh, remember that uh, a caregiver's role may be huge for a stroke patient. <coughs> Clark and co-workers tried to implement a model which was effective in decreasing burden, anxiety and depression of caregiver in improving psychological outcomes for patients and reducing overall costs when tested in a single center. The results of their study showed that um, there were no differences between groups on patients' functional outcomes or caregivers' burden when this was tested in, in um, many places. So the implementation was not successful, although the, the preliminary study showed that this model could be a good one. Reasons why complex interventions become embedded and work are diverse, commonly involve barriers and facilitators at the human resource and team level. In stable organizations, change is an accepted part of service provision, evidence-based interventions more likely to become embedded. So there might have been also organizational things. And facilitating a partnership between caregivers and staff in supporting stroke survivor added another layer of complexity to implementation. The way of using effective programs may change in practice. One point is that if we implement effective programs, we should not change the way of using them. This example is from a graded repetitive, repetitive arm supplementary program, which showed that the program was not used in the way in, each, in which it was shown to be effective. Sometimes simple is working. Although multifaceted programs are regarded as good, uh, an Austra Australian study showed that implementing a new rehabilitation assessment tool, multifaceted program was not more effective than education only. 
So maybe we have to think what are we implementing? A simple thing or, or more complex things. This example shows that it's possible to use benchmarking controlled trials to show the effectiveness of a new process. More than 10 years ago, um, the LOHIAS uh, developed an active hip fracture rehabilitation process in Lahti City Hospital. Later, we could show that the cost of hip fracture decreased. So the red line is uh, the uh, patient from Lahti, the green one is the, the whole country, and, and the blue one is the region around Lahti. So the uh, adjusted cost index period decreased in Lahti after 2005. And also the days at hospital decreased compared to other municipalities in the region or in Finland. And the proportion of institutional care diminished. As well as the costs. So it's possible to study the results of implementation from reg registers too. And as we know, in Finland we have quite good registers, so we should use them in these kind of studies. So some example from low back pain. One example of low back uh, pain guideline implementation from Germany. They compared multifaceted guideline implementation and uh, that with a combination of training of practice nurses, motivational counseling with controls who got the guideline by mail. Patients' functional capacity was higher in intervention groups and there were reductions of days in pain per year in the intervention groups. Their implementation was the following. Seminars included information on performance of the diagnostic triage, identification of red flags, early identification of yellow flags, informing and advising patients. The third session gave room for discussion of implementation barriers and individual experiences. Doctors got information about local faci facilities for patients' groups and individual educational visits by study nurses to participating uh, uh, GPs were done twice or uh, to hand over the guideline and after three and six months. During the third session, GPs uh, of this uh, uh, guideline um, uh, plus um, a multi, uh, motivational counseling group were introduced uh, to motivational counseling strategies. Two nurses per practice received 20-hour training designed to increase the nurses' skills to motivate low back pain patients for regular physical activities. Practice nurses were asked to invite patients for up to three counseling sessions. Uh, they should use specifically designed brochures on motivational and behavioral change and posters to communicate key messages. Study coordinators contacted the practice nurses regularly to identify barriers and problems. The control group received the guideline by mail. The indirect costs and direct costs were less in intervention groups, but effects attenuated when adjusting for differences of healthcare utilization before the study. There is also preliminary evidence that the adherence to established clinical practice guidelines may assist with decreasing healthcare utilization and costs. And Rees and co-workers, they studied the effect of multifaceted implementation in low back pain guidelines. Their primary outcome was referral to secondary healthcare within 12 weeks. Multifaceted implementation changed the referral behavior and was cost effective, but patient preferences not necessarily supported that. 
and then shortly about cardiac rehabilitation. So the effectiveness is uh, well known, and uh, Van Engel has studied that, uh, uh, how to use the algorithm for, from medical records. Then they had an expert advisory group identify problems, and the guideline group revised the algorithm. And the source of variation was assessment-based, and they added, added new instruments uh, after this process. So, what about the future? In future, we will get more information about the effectiveness of implementation in rehabilitation context, while several study protocols have been published. Because rehabilitation of many chronic long-term diseases is important to reduce costs. Rehabilitation should be emphasized in current care guidelines in every hospital district. The pathway from acute care to long-term rehabilitation should be fluent, and implementation needs engagement of professionals and leaders in every level of phase or phase on the pathway, even during the big change of the healthcare system what we are going to have, I think. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for an interesting presentation and an excellent overview. I think that we now have time for maybe one quick question or comment to Professor Mikkelson, please. Mariukka Mäkelä, wait for the mic. Thank you. That's an uh, interesting, interesting view, um, and, and uh, much, much useful information. I would, I would like to go back to the uh, role of the caregivers in these diseases that often require the support from from outsiders. So, uh, how applicable do you think uh, again information from other countries is to Finnish caregivers? Do we have uh, do we have differences between? Uh, those who help their relatives or friends in Finland and, and those who would do so elsewhere? I think I can't answer to your question. I, I, I'd, I'm not so deeply involved in that, but, but um, I think in Finland we should... Uh, uh, my experience is that we should uh, give more um, or put more pressure on that so we we should uh, do co-work with caregivers okay there's one more hand so bear with me one more question and then that's it Please introduce yourself uh, yes thank you Esa Katakala from the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health uh, we made a small study in occupational health and about the transfer, uh, knowledge transfer needs uh, in rehabilitation of uh, people. And uh, within that uh, study, I made a small exercise to see the process of uh, rehabilitation uh, if I go as a patient or to the first to the healthcare system, then I am wait. I will wait for the decision for rehabilitation, uh, and finally the rehabilitation in some kind of institution or caregivers. And it was interesting to know, see that each of those stakeholders had their own processes, but those processes didn't cross between each others. So more of a comment, thank you. Thank you again.